Well, hello there. Fancy seeing you here. My name is Matthew. I am your BRS beginner guru. Coming at you with episode 38, part B in the beginner how-to guide for saltwater aquariums and reef tanks, top 10 beginner mistakes. In case you missed episode 38, part A, check it out. But here's a recap of the first three mistakes we talked about. Common issue number one, new tank syndrome. It is when ammonia and nitrite, both of which are quite toxic for fish, rise rapidly in a new aquarium. How do you fix new tank syndrome? Well, first of all, you gotta do a large water change. The common beginner mistake number two, which I still make to this day, is not preventing nuisance algae growth. But what I did next was the worst thing I could possibly do, and that was a pretty good recap. But without further ado, here we go, episode 38. Part B. Number three is causing a cyanobacteria problem. Cyanobacteria looks very similar to algae, but it's actually a bacteria. It typically grows on the surface of the sand bed and on the rock works, and when left unchecked, it can cover everything in your tank. Let me see if I can find a picture or a video, but I had some instances where it just blanketed everything in the purple looking slime that looked terrible. It's highly photosynthetic, it loves areas of low flow, and it seems to thrive in low nutrient environments. And I'm talking about if you use too much GFO and you bring your nitrates and phosphates down to zero. Typically, it shows up in tanks where the owner is obsessive compulsive about maintenance. I'm very guilty of that. I've gotten better, but I'm very guilty of that. In their quest to prevent green hair algae or other turf algaes, what these beginners will do is go crazy with maintenance, do huge water changes, and usually will use some sort of chemical media like GFO to make sure they keep their nitrates and their phosphates zero, like below zero. But cyanobacteria thrives in those low nutrient environments. It used to be that we thought zero nitrates and zero phosphates was a good thing, but we now know that your corals need nitrates and phosphates to grow and to thrive. So keeping zero nitrates and zero phosphates is a terrible idea. In fact, I shoot to keep my nitrate levels somewhere between three and five parts per million and my phosphate levels somewhere between 0.05 and 0.15 parts per million. So with any new tank, you're really walking this tight rope between two little nutrients, which can cause cyanobacteria outbreak, and too many nutrients, which can lead to green hair algae. It's a fine line to tread, but if you test frequently, you'll be able to get on top of the problems before they spiral out of control. There are chemical treatments for cyanobacteria. I've used ChemiClean many times in the past, and it does work well. But ChemiClean is an antibiotic, so it has the potential to kill off some beneficial bacteria in your tank. The problem I've noticed with ChemiClean, if I rely on ChemiClean too much, I can eventually get a dinoflagellate outbreak, which is way, way worse, but that's a conversation for another day. So then what's the best way to prevent cyanobacteria from ever showing up in your tank? Number one is having a good flow rate throughout your entire tank, making sure there are no dead spots anywhere, and also being sure you test frequently and that your nitrates and your phosphate levels are at least detectable, certainly not at zero. If you do end up getting cyano, which you probably will, I've gotten cyano in probably all of my tanks at one point or another. I found the best way to get rid of it if you don't wanna rely on antibiotics like ChemiClean, is just increase your flow in the areas that it's growing, do some sort of manual removal using a gravel vacuum every single day, and increase your nitrate and phosphate levels. Usually if I do all three of these things, I can get rid of cyanobacteria probably in about a month. Beginner mistake number four is not planning for fish aggression. Most fish are at least somewhat territorial, and in a small home aquarium, they're going to protect their space to some degree. Some fish start out relatively peaceful, but over time may develop more territorial tendencies. There are a plethora of ways to deal with fish aggressivity, from choosing the right fish to begin with, learning when best to introduce a new fish, creating more hiding spaces, and feeding more. For example, let's say you wanna add a semi-aggressive fish like a six-line wrasse. If you do any sort of research, you're gonna find some people who absolutely love six-line wrasses and who have them and they live peacefully with the other fish. And then you're gonna find examples of people who think they are the devil in beautiful purple stripes because they go after everyone. But I love my six-line wrasse and my six-line wrasse is actually really peaceful. But the trick for a six-line wrasse and for other aggressive fish is you need to add them last to your tank. Whenever you're adding fish to your tank, 
tank, you should always add the most peaceful fish first and the most aggressive fish last. Because what ends up happening, if you add a six line wrasse first to your tank, he or she is going to think the entire tank is his or her territory and then is going to defend it a lot when you add any other sort of fish. But if you add more peaceful fish first and they're able to find their own area and their territory, then you add the six line wrasse at the very end. The six line wrasse already knows that this territory is for these other fish and tends to leave them alone more. Let's say you followed our stock list from episode 31B and everything goes fine for the first few weeks, but then let's say you start to notice some aggressive behavior and some nipped fins. What do you do now? The first thing you could do is try feeding a little bit more. Maybe everyone's not getting enough food, so just adding a little bit more might make the aggressivity die down. You could also try feeding different parts of the tank because maybe the one area you're feeding isn't getting to all of your inhabitants. So maybe try feeding two or three places at the same time and see if that helps. Another option, if this is possible for you, is to rearrange your aquascape and do it in such a way that gives more hiding places and more visual breaks so the fish don't always have to be staring at each other. Then again, there are some fish species that tend to do better with more of their species rather than less. For example, if you have two chromis, you might have one chromis just constantly pecking at the other chromis and maybe eventually killing it. But if you put in five, six, seven chromis, then they may be able to spread the aggression around, which is better for everyone. Sometimes another trick that works is that you can catch an aggressive fish and put it in the breeder box. Sometimes giving a fish a timeout in a breeder box for like a week allows all the other fish to reassert their authority over the aquascape and then when you release that aggressive fish back, things can even out. It doesn't work all the time, but it does work sometimes. But if all else fails and sometimes it just does, then you're gonna have to remove the aggressive fish and find a new home for it. Oftentimes your local fish store is more than happy to take that fish back or you can find a friend or local aquarium club that will take it for you. Number five, not knowing how to treat fish disease. When I started out in the hobby, I really tried to become a fish doctor. I learned everything I could about bacterial, viral, and fungal infections and diseases. I knew the difference between gram positive, gram negative, and broad spectrum antibiotics, and I knew which one to use to treat which disease. I could theoretically tell you if a fish had ick, velvet, or brooklynella, and which treatment would work best for each. Then I bought a whole bin of medications, including some dangerous ones like formaldehyde, which I have long since gotten rid of, safely of course. I've had some success in treating sick fish in the past, but I've had way more failures. And I've come to the realization that I'm just never going to be an expert. I don't deal with the volume of fish on a daily basis to be able to see the diseases and know how to treat them frequently enough. I actually don't really treat any of my fish for disease anymore. If I do notice a disease and it's something that's really obvious, whether it's Brooklynella, ick, or velvet, I will treat them in a quarantine tank, but I only use reef safe medications now. I rarely use copper. And to be honest, usually the fish end up dying anyways because ick, velvet, and brooklynella, by the time you notice them, are really fast killers. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, check out these two really long and detailed blogs I wrote on my personal website, myfirstfishtank.com. We'll put links down below if you're interested. The best thing you can do for your fish besides treating them with medication is giving them an adequately sized tank and a stress-free environment because a fish that is stress-free is usually a healthy and happy fish. But if and when you do notice a sick fish in your display tank, my recommendation would be to remove them as quickly as possible and put them in some sort of hospital quarantine tank. Even if you don't treat them in the tank, it will be less likely that they will be able to infect the other members. It'll also be helpful to learn the basics for fish disease because you will know the difference about when to panic because your fish is in imminent threat of death and when to just sit back and see what happens. One good example of this would be fungal infections. They seem to show up in fish from time to time and I've had clownfish that get them. Oftentimes they look like some sort of white cottony growth near the gills or on the body. And the first time I saw it, I panicked. But I've learned that most fungal infections that are exterior in nature tend to resolve on their own. So there's no need to panic for those things. But then there are other issues that appear like white dots or some sort of 
white slime all over their body. And the most likely culprit is gonna be ick, velvet, or brooklynella. These will kill really quickly. If you see a fish with that in your display tank, you can either cross your fingers and hope the other fish are strong enough not to get it, or you can remove that sick fish and try to treat it. But typically, by the time you notice it in one fish, it's had a chance to spread throughout your tank. If you do have an outbreak of one of those three terrible things and it kills all your fish, then you're gonna have to let your tank sit fallow for three to four months with no fish to make sure that when you put new fish in, they also won't get sick. The moral of the story for this is just quarantine all new fish. Even if you don't learn how to treat fish at all, worst case scenario, those new fish die in quarantine. But on the bright side, those new fish won't bring disease to all of your other fish. Because there is nothing worse than having a thriving tank and thinking, I'm just gonna add one more fish. That one brings ick, velvet, or brooklynella to the tank. And now you have a tank with no fish. Okay, I'm gonna make a promise to you guys. That was way too long. We took two whole videos to sum up the first five of the common beginner mistakes, but we're only gonna do one more video, episode 38, part C, and I promise, I promise, we will do the remaining five. As always, everyone, thanks for watching. Happy reefing, be well. We'll see you next time.